Howdy, y'all. I am Adam, the Renaissance Nerd. I love real Star Wars. And it doesn't get more real Star Wars than my Expanded Universe Informal Book Club. We continue with our next installment, The Truce at Bakara. As I said when we started this, we are going down the main story plot line of the Expanded Universe timeline. We're going in chronological order. And we are now beginning the actual adventure of all new Star Wars after Return of the Jedi. Literally taking place the day after Death Star 2 exploded. Truce at Bakra begins. All right, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview of the book, the plot. There will be some minor spoilers. I'm not going to go into full spoiler detail. But there will be some minor spoilers, so you are warned. And then I'm going to discuss my key takeaways from the book and concerning characters and themes. And basically... Um, how much, whether or not I enjoyed it. Okay, truce, the truce at Bakra, as I said, takes place literally beginning the day after the celebration on Endor. The Death Star 2 is destroyed. Emperor Palpatine is dead. Vader has been redeemed and is once again Anakin Skywalker and is one with the Force. The day later, Luke, turns out Luke's all beat up after getting Force lightninged two or three times by Palpatine. Han and Leia are trying to find private time, but there is no time. There is no time to rest for a distress signal has reached Endor because that's where the Imperial fleet was, the main part of the Imperial fleet was stationed. An outer rim system, Bakara, is being attacked by an unknown alien threat. The Sea Rook or Sea Ruvi. But Palpatine is dead. The Empire fleet is scattered right now, regrouping after their loss at Endor. It is up to the Rebel Alliance to go help. Mon Mothma decides, okay, Leia, you're going to go help. Leia needs a crew. Han volunteers. But guess what, Leia? You are only in charge of diplomacy. Luke. Luke is given command of a small escort fleet to go and find out what's happening at Bakra. So Luke, Han, and Leia... Our holy trinity of heroes set off together on an adventure. What a novel idea to have the holy trinity of Star Wars go off on an adventure together right away in the expanded universe. Ain't that grand? Ain't that just a dandy of an idea? So they set off to Bakra. They arrive at Bakra to find the Imperial Colony under attack by the alien threat of the Sea Ruby. Who are the Sea Ruby or the Sea Rook? I'll just call them Sea Rook. That's how I've always... I know Sea Ruby's the poor. I'm just going to call them the Sea Rook, though. The Sea Rook. Who are the Sea Rook? They are a reptilian species that speak through, basically, whistles and piping fluting. Because they, they have beaks. They don't have teeth, but they got beaks. And they like, whoo, like, I think R2. That's, what, that's how it describes them. It sounds like an astromech droid beeping around. They are trying to enslave Bakara on the invitation of Emperor Palpatine, by the way. He invited them because he wanted what they have. They have the ability to extract a living soul and, and take it into a droid. And Palpatine wanted a droid, droid ar not so much a droid army, but droid, droid star, star fighters. That's what he wanted. He wanted that tech. So he invited them, and with his death, he is the Sea Ruby, the Sea Rook. They come in. They are, they, they're, they're, they're evil. They're evil. We're going to get into that later. But within them, within their thing, within their, within their group is a force sensitive name, Dev Sabwara. Dev, Dev Sabwara. And he has been brainwashed. His poor soul has been brainwashed by repeatedly. So he thinks that being in tech into a droid is the greatest thing ever. And he can't wait for it to have his day. And he has told the people of Bakara that, hey, we are here to help you. We are here to send you to the grandness, greatness of the Sea Rook cause by being, making you all droids. And, of course, they're the Imperial garrison there is defending it. Governor Nereus, he is the uh, Willick Nereus. He is our one of he. He is one of the bad guys, even though he is a temporarily allies with our rebel heroes. He is not good. He's fighting it off with his commander, Thanos, and the Senate, the Imperial Senate, or the Bakuran Imperial Bakuran Senate. They're sort of Imperials, but they're not. 
Some of them appear up there. We're going to get that with Gariel Captison. Captison, I think that's how he said it. Get into it with her in a bit. She's one of them to talk about the characters. So what happens? Sea Rook almost having more run. Our rebel heroes arrive. They help drive off the Sea Rook. And the tentative truce begins. The tentative truce at Bakura begins. Of course, the Imperials do not believe Palpatine is dead. It takes a little convincing until finally actual official confirmation comes from the Imperial fleet. <sighs> Meanwhile, Luke is having... Oh, I forgot. Luke was sent here. He got a vision. He got a warning from Obi-Wan, basically. I forgot that part in the beginning. Gets a, he gets a, gets a warning from Obi-Wan to go there because this could be bad. This could be bad. You got to go there, kid. So they get there. Luke starts having more Force visions. Dev, while when he has moments of clarity, reaches out to Luke, but then of course gets keeps getting brainwashed by Blue Scale. I'm not gonna try and pronounce the Sea Rook names because they're really, really weird. I'm just, I'm just going by what Dev called them: Blue Scale or Firarung or Iv, Iv Picus. He was the admiral. Firarung is the one in charge of attackment. I could say that one, but anyway, Blue Scale keeps brain brain effing him. So, so begins the slow diplomatic dance. Nobody trusts anybody. Eventually, though. The truce is agreed upon once the confirmation of Palpatine's death is, conf is, is arrives. <sighs> Meanwhile, Gary O'Captison, she is the young senator returned from her indoctrination at the at the on Coruscant and Imperial Worlds. She is distrustful of Luke. Luke is infatuated with her. At the same time, <sighs> Governor Nereus is trying to constantly plot a way to basically either capture or kill our rebel heroes. Han and Leia simply want, Han simply wants to protect Leia, gets overprotective at times. Leia is having serious emotional PTSD about the revelations that Darth Vader was Anakin Skywalker, her father. All the while, the Sea Ruby, the Sea Rook, I keep going back from the Sea Rook are constantly probing the defenses. They want another Force-sensitive like Dev, they want Luke because using him, they can try and then force people into the droids. Eventually, everything goes to hell where Nereus tries to kill Luke, tries to kidnap Leia. Big rescue attempts, a lot of fun stuff, a lot of classic fun Star Wars stuff happens. We end up with a giant clash in space, the Imperial and the Rebel fleets against the Sea Rook fleet. They manage to punch out the Sea Rook, but then, of course, the Imperials, when the Sea Rook is defeated, Nereus turns on the Rebels, but then... Luke, with his heroics, on the ship, after turning Dev back to the light side, forcing him free of his brainwashing, defeat the Sea Rook on their own ship, use the Sea Rook ship against it. It's, it's all kinds of great stuff. It's all kinds of great high-octane, high-adventure Star Wars fun. And, of course, it ends with a bittersweet happy ending. Not going to talk about that completely. Okay, I will. Dev gets brought back to the light, but he dies. And Luke had a moment where he thought he, he has the vision of having his first apprentice, and it takes away from him and it hurts. At the same time, Luke, having won over the heart of Gariel Captison, realizes quickly that she 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 breaks his he she breaks his heart a little bit when she says she could feel for him, but she must devote her time to Bakra now that they are free of the Empire. And Luke's heart is broken, and that's one of the themes we're going to touch on. So. That's Truce of Bakker in a nutshell. I hope it wasn't too rambling there, but we're going to get into it. So this book, it is a good book, even though it was not the first book written in the EU, in the new EU. The, 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 the Zahn Trilogy is the first one. This one was written a couple of years later, I believe. Let's have a look. Uh, 1994. Okay, so this was written in the middle of the Zahn Trilogy. I think I'm drawing on my memories. I remember it came out and I scoffed at it. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm reading what's happening five years after Return of the Jedi. You expect me to get this and go back in time and read something that already happened? Well, I did. And I'm glad I did because this is a good book. Kathy Tires does a very good job overall. She has some problems in my opinion, but she does a good job overall of capturing the feel of our Holy Trinity as they as they're embarking on this new era the post imperial or the pre new republic still kind of civil war against the galactic empire so what is great about this book the characters are number one what's great the characters and the theme 
tied with the characters and overall the respect shown to Lucas's Star Wars. So let's talk about the characters. Luke's development in this is just, it's great because you have Luke. He's fresh off, not so much his victory, not his victory over Palpatine, but his victory in redeeming Vader back to Anakin. Because early on, Luke keeps telling everybody, I, I didn't beat the Emperor. Vader did it. Vader did it. He, he turned and he stopped Palpatine saving me. So what we get here is there's two, there's three, there's, I believe I'm going to look at it, either two or three point growth of Luke's character now that he is, he fully, un, he fully realizes that the future of the Jedi, it's all on him now. He is it. On the one hand, we watch his growth as a Jedi throughout this whole book in the few short days that this with which this book takes place Luke does some incredibly incredible growth in terms of understanding things one when he, in the beginning he figures out the Jedi healing trance that is huge because that is that is so important he figures out the Jedi healing trance let's see if I'm looking over here I'm looking at my notes all right so part of the lore building Luke knows he needs to learn so many things and he first figures out the Jedi healing on stuff like uh, page 8. I'm going to try and look at actual pages when I'm on, my, on my notes this time when we're talking about stuff. On page 8, yeah, that's the beginning. It starts right away early in the book where Luke is very insistent that he, he, he must figure it out because he can't be, he cannot go through Bacta healing treatments all the time. He's got to figure out healing trance. So then right away, we go jump to, I want to jump to page 16. Page 16 is the end of chapter 1. Uh, yeah, that's, um, it's just more, okay, yeah, that's just more of, here it is. This is Luke speaking. I'm not helping anyone if I'm just lying down, but he had to shake his reckless reputation. If he wanted the respect of the rebel fleet, Yoda had commissioned him to pass on what he had learned. To Luke's mind, that meant rebuilding the Jedi Order as soon as he got the chance. Anyone else could pilot a flagship, a fighter ship. No one else could recruit and train new Jedi. Luke right away understands what he has to do. This isn't Favreau Mandalorian or where's Luke? What's Luke been doing all these years? Oh, waiting for Grogu. No, this is Luke right away understanding it. And later in the book, he when he for the moment he breaks dead free of his brainwashing he sees right away even right then begins to try and be a good master right away laying down the proper tenets of how to be a jedi right there so luke understands the responsibility that the future for for the future that rebuilding the jedi it's all on him and then you go later on in on page 52 page 52 luke is still struggling with his force awareness he, he as much as he's grown he still can lose it pretty quickly early on here because he's little, he's also a little physically weak at this time. He's still recovering, but slight distractions and he will still lose control. And even after all his victories, Luke knows he's not the leader he needs to be yet. He understands he's not a perfect leader. He has flaws and he accepts them and knows he needs to grow again. Luke is a hero. He's an actual hero going through the hero's journey still. And then, so that that's that's part of Luke's. Uh, let's stick with the force stuff. I'm gonna, I don't want to jump around here. No, my even though my page my page notes jump around on what I want to talk about Luke. Let's stick with force stuff. Um, Luke throughout this at certain points towards the end when he's really engaged with the sea rook, he feels the dark side. Because he looks at the Sea Rook and he, even though the Sea Rook are force blind, I forgot to mention that, Sea Rook are force blind. They exist in the force, but they're force blind. They can't see it. Luke, Luke looks at them and he sees nothing but dark side. They are pure dark side in their actions. And he realizes how difficult it is. At one point when he's fighting the Sea Rook, page 279, he's fighting... He's fighting and he's hurt already just some, from some damage. And he feels the lure. He realizes if I give in to my anger, he remembers his fight against Vader. And he realizes the power, the surge in the final fight where he drew on the dark side, his anger when Vader was saying, 
If you won't turn, then perhaps Leia will. Luke realizes that he could give in to the dark side. He could find the power. He could wipe the floor of the three sea rookies fighting at once. But then the Jedi calm takes over. The Jedi calm takes over. And he realizes that, no, that kind of fast power, it'll just rot me. Gotta stay true, must resist, resist the dark side, and it's gonna be a fight that he has to do for the rest of his life. The dark side will always be there, always be tempting, and he realizes that now, and that's what's very cool. That's confirmed on page 309. Page 309, he confirms that. So this is a great understanding, a, an early blueprint of Luke's desire to build, rebuild the Jedi Order, but at the same time, he knows it's not going to be easy. And he knows it's never going to be easy on him. That he has to be stronger than maybe he is now mentally and and, poss- and, pro- and physically. He's not there yet, but he's growing. And he understands that because he's, 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 he's down to earth. He's not the bestest ever Ray who just downloads it all and she's perfect at everything. No real training. No, Luke understands he still has much to learn. The other aspect of Luke in this is the theme of connection luke he has just come off knowing i mean remember we're only a couple days out uh, we're only a few days out of him understanding that leia's a sister that the love he had for her has to transfer from the pre-knowledge of that sexual attraction to the love of his sister to loving her as a sister and the fact that han is leia's love leia's love is for han in that sense and and, he, and also because they're brother and sister that ain't gonna happen because it's icky but luke wonders and that's where gary old captison comes in as uh, one of the other the, the other characters that are focused on the book the, I, I think i should have said before there's really only four focal characters in the book even though we get time behind hans uh, time behind hans eyes time behind chewie's eyes and 3po this is a story about luke leia dev and gary old captison that's who this story is about so gary old captison she is a young senator of Bakra, she got training on the at the imperial in the imperial core worlds, and she got a little indoctrinated by that, and that's one of the themes about this. Indoctrination is a theme in this book. We're gonna come back to that when I talk about the themes. She has also religious beliefs when it comes to the Jedi. She thinks that she believes in this whole cosmic balance thing. It's the only ever time we ever think we ever hear something like this. She believes in the cosmic balance and that the Jedi were part of the imbalance and that's why all kind of bad things happen because the jedi had too much power with the force and it's a little warped but it's done well and you're like and and you know it's done well when you're making a face thinking lady you're nuts you know it's done well when you make a face while you're reading saying lady you're nuts so she is luke's possible love his first possible love interest since reconciling the fact that leia is his sister and on page 82 is the first time dude, when Luke sees her. You remember, Luke is a dude. Luke is a dude. He's not a traditional Jedi from the Old Republic where your emotions must be clamped down. You have to rein them in. Compassion is the only love you're permitted. You're not permitted, um, you're not permitted close connecting love that will draw passion because passion is, is Sith. Passion leads to the dark side because your emotions can get in the way of good logical sound jedi thinking but that tells you right there that luke is oh this is the first sign that luke is not going to follow the traditional jedi code because he's attracted to this woman she's a bright spot in the force to him and it's captivating to him and he and she's beautiful and he wants to be with her and he spends the whole book trying to win her over and he does win her over but like i said in the end she breaks his heart and says i have to give my life to my world now i'm never going to leave it again I have we have to rebuild we have to be ready and you you have a destiny out there i can't go with you and luke accepts it but he's heartbroken that's part of the bittersweet ending the two-part bittersweet ending for luke and it's the theme ongoing we see that luke wants connections he has family connection he has his family he has han luke i mean he has han and leia chewy and the droids right now and you know eventually lando and others but and he's got friends like wedge but he realizes he wants more. And that is the sign he realizes he's not going to, he's probably not going to follow the traditional Jedi codes. He's going to rewrite them. Because let's be honest, the traditional Jedi codes are part of the reason the Jedi became 
decadent and complacent. They were too rigid, too locked in their ways. They were unable to evolve. But Luke is going to evolve the order going forward. And then, of course, that is the theme. Luke is going to go through a series of romances until he does land with his one true love, who we will meet in the Thrawn trilogy. Mara Jade. But the, the, it's a long road to Luke and Mara. Luke's got to go a long road, but he's going to try and he's going to fail and he's going to have more heartbreak. But that's that's just that's what's going to happen and that's what's great. Luke is, you, you, you connect with Luke. Once more, you connect with Luke, not as a hero, but he's a man who has longing. He sees what Han and Leia, what's beginning there, and he knows he wants it. And at the same time, the other bittersweet part, like I said, but he balances it with the fact that he has to rebuild the Jedi Order. And he saw right here, his first chance, he had it, but the circumstances just snatched it away from him because that's just what happens sometimes. He had a, he, he had a possible first apprentice in Dev, and poor Dev. We're going to transition into Dev and why Dev was a very interesting character to, again, wind in, go into the theme. We're going to go right to the into theme of indoctrination. You know, I'll save Dev forever. We'll save Dev forever. Let's go to Leia. Leia is the other central character in this because of her emotional state. As I said before, she is suffering emotional PTSD, the fact that Vader was Anakin. And she spends two-thirds of the book bitch-fitting constantly. I hate Vader. I don't want anything to do with him. He's not my father. Blah, blah, blah. My father was Bail Organa. Right here. Um... Uh, her PTSD suffers on a couple different levels. One, early on right here, because of who Vader was, she's saying she doesn't want anything to do with the Force. Page 108, she goes on this whole thing as, I don't want anything to do with the Force. It, 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 it's part of Vader. I don't want it. And it's all leading up to page 144. Page 144, the only time this happens in the Expanded Universe. Force Ghost Anakin. Force Ghost Anakin appears to Leia. I'm sorry, it's not 144, it's 145. Here it is. Leia's in her apartment, in her temporary quarters, and she comes in there and sees Anakin. And this, and to me, it's short, but it's powerful. Whoever he was, he didn't belong in her apartment. She eyed her blaster just out of reach on the repulsor bed. It probably lacked a certain threat against apparitions, if this was one. Who are you? she demanded. State your business. Do not fear me, the figure said softly. Tell Luke to remember that fear is of the dark side. Who was this person, bringing messages to Luke into her allegedly private quarters? A Bakran? An Imperial? Who are you? The stranger stepped sideways into, the darker, into a darker spot, where his glow brightened. He was tall with a broad, pleasant face and dark hair. I am your father, Leia. Vader. A chill star started at her feet and shivered its way to her scalp. His very presence stirred every dark emotion she owned. Fear, hatred. Leia, do not fear me. I am forgiven, but I have much that I wish to atone for. I must clear your heart and your mind of anger. Anger is the dark side, too. And then she says, I want you to leave. Dis discorporate, fade out, or whatever you do. Wait. He did not move away from the wall. If anything, he seemed to shrink in size and proximity. I am no longer the man that you feared. Can you not see me as a stranger, not an old enemy? Can you not? Yeah, yeah, sorry. You can't restore Alderaan. You can't bring back the people you murdered or comfort their widows and orphans. You can't undo what you did to the Alliance. Old pain jabbed her like a fresh wound. And then, uh, this, is, this is Anakin. I strengthened the alliance, although that was not my intent. He extended the glimmering arm. The mellow voice sounded wrong. The mild, naked face did not look as if it had hidden for decades behind a black mask. Leia, things are changing. I may never be able to return to you. There is no justifying my actions. Yet your brother saved me from darkness. You must believe this. I heard Luke. But I'm not Luke or your teacher, or your confessor. I'm only your daughter by a cruel trick of fate. Of the Force, he insisted. Even that served the purpose. I am proud of your strengths. I do not ask for absolution, only your forgiveness. 
See, that it, it, there's a little more, but I'm gonna stop it. it. That is one of the most powerful scenes in the expanded universe. It is stuck in my brain for over 20 years now since I first read this. It is always stuck in my brain. And this leads to eventually, eventually, by the end of the book, Leia comes full circle. She says she finds the forgiveness because she realizes that holding on to it wasn't doing her any good. And she understands certain parts of now after after her experiences in, in towards the end there in the in the in the climax. She understands that, OK, I am her father. I am I am a Skywalker. Anakin was my father. And there is maybe a future for me with the force. I mean, it's just it's powerful. It is powerful. And that's why Leia's journey in this is the beginning of the strong Leia, the real Leia Organa, eventually Leia Organa Solo, eventually Jedi Leia Organa Solo that we get. This is the beginning, the foundation of what we're going to get for a real Leia, not General Leia, no, Leia Organa Solo, Jedi. Uh, all right, let's go into Dev and Gariel, and then he'll link into the themes. So, Dev is just, he's hes your, he's just the sad case. This poor brainwash, this poor kid who was abducted by the sea rook from his world because he was force sensitive, brainwashed and used by them for their despicable, disgusting entechment. But he's, he, he links into the theme of indoctrination and how disgusting can be when it's this kind of mind-bending indoctrination or the political dogmatic indoctrination that Gariel suffers from early on until she finally, she does resolve it eventually, but she suffers from it. And the theme, it's one of the major themes in this is that indoctrination can either be light and airy or and, and in, or directly and intrusive, but it's still insidious either way. And that is you. And there is always light if you either look to reason or reach for a hand. Like Gariel saw reason when when everything was hitting the fan. She saw that okay, th th this is wrong. I must side with my people. I must side with the alliance. And Dev, a hand was reached out. Luke reached out a hand, and Dev took it. And so that indoctrination is despicable. At the same time, there's another, the other theme in this is hope, in my opinion. Again, one of the biggest themes of Star Wars always there is this hope. Never give up hope. Luke never gives up hope in this book. He's always looking for a way to get them out of trouble, to a way to keep, either keep people alive or to just save the day because that's what a hero does. So the hope is the other major theme of this book. Now let's just talk about a few nice little fun facts that this book, again, to the to the more mechanical theme of staying true to the to the the vision of George. Right away, makes it clear right in the beginning, the war isn't over. The war against the Empire is not over. Yes, the Emperor is defeated. But the fleet is still out there. Right away, it is just boom. You got, you, you can't just give up. You cannot give up and say, okay, it's all over. We won the day. No, 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 no. The war is still on. Don't just rest on your laurels. There's lots of fight left. The Rebel Alliance is still the Rebel Alliance. It is not the New Republic yet. And they can't rely. And this is why, part, this is part of the reason ba going to Bakra is so important. It's an attempt to say, oh, it, building on the success of the victory at Endor. Okay, we have to grab up a new possible ally really quickly. Also, Bakar happens to be a resource of very of repulsor technology and other stuff, so they, they'd be a good one. <sighs> at the same time, let's see, what's another theme here? Ba -ba 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 what's another good little thing? Um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let me look at my notes here. Ah. Uh, Already talked about that. Evil. It's foreshadowing that evil is going to come in this franchise in the EU in many different shapes. The Empire, those who are Empire to the bone, like Governor Nereus, they reveal their um, they reveal their true colors no matter what. The Empire, old school Imperials will always be a threat, but the Sea Rook reveal that. 
there are going to be other threats going forward in the EU that are not empire related. Uh, it's just the sea rook are, as I said, they at one point, uh, I believe so I said it was 279, when Luke's fighting them on their ship, he sees them that they are they are dark side. What they're doing is dark side force power. Even though they're not force sensitives, what they're doing is tipping the balance. There's going to be things. I mean, this foreshadows certain other events like the Black Fleet Crisis and eventually the Vong, the Yuzhan Vong. There's more, there are other evils out there. There's not just the Empire. There aren't just the Sith. There are going to be other, other foes. So that's what I like. That it foreshadows that. Other interesting things. Little rules to live by. Page 19. The rules of force ghosts. Uh, this is when Obi-Wan comes to visit Luke. Basically, page 19, Ben's giving him the warning, but Luke basically says at this point, Force ghosts can't interact with this world. They can't interact. They're there to give occasional advice. Cryptic. They can't interact. Rules of Star Wars. Force ghosts do not interact with the prime material world. Sorry, they don't. Other interesting things. There's one page. I, sh I forgot to mark the page. It's at the apex of the battle, right when the Imperials have turned on the Rebels after the Sea Rook have been beaten. Han and Leia are, are on the Falcon with Chewie and 3PO, and, and they realize that everything's going to hell out there, but they have to start stop the Imperial frigate from blowing everybody up. So they realize that if they ram a particular ship, they can knock out the frigate and give the, ex, the squadrons a chance to get out of there. This is a moment to me, when I read this, I thought of the disgusting thing that is The Last Jedi. Here you have two of our main heroes, two of the Holy Trinity. They are ready to sacrifice themselves in a ramming attack to save others. Because they. this is a real fight. Sometimes you have to do drastic things to save other people. As opposed to The Last Jedi when Finn is about to ram himself into that mini Death Star beam. Which was the right thing to do. But then here comes Ralph Tico. Crashes into him. Says, we don't win through fighting. We win through love. Now, Han and Leia are in love. And they, they have a moment there where I want the last feeling is. Han's like, I want the last feeling is her lips on mine. It's the last thing I feel here. 2-1. But then, of course, Luke saves them. Luke does his hero thing and saves them. But they are ready to do it. Yeah, they were in love, but love wasn't going to save them. Love was going to give them the strength to do what was necessary. The hard choice. The ulti possible ultimate sacrifice to save others. That is the difference between understanding the vision of George Lucas and Disney Star Wars. I wanted to make that final point. In comparison between the two. That one scene crystallizes why this book is an excellent book in terms of the vision of George Lucas as opposed to the trash that is Disney Star Wars. Alright, so it is a good book despite a few minor things here. I think Kathy Tears has, she, she has one little, if there's one writing to flaw her writing in this is that she leans on the nicknames too much from the original trilogy, Goldenrod, Your Worshipness, Your Worshipfulness, Your high, Prancy, Sweetheart, uh, Kid, Farm Boy. You know, it, it's mainly surrounding Han. Han uses way too many of the nicknames. Yeah, he picked up for everybody over the years. A little too heavy on that. It's a little cheeky at times. But it's overlookable. Uh, let's see, anything else? Oh, yeah. Luke's hand is already repaired. It was repaired the next day. He's not walking around with a glove on his hand anymore. It was repaired. Give me this stupid, oh, he appeared, you know, he gives the words his glove. Give me, give me that crap. Uh, all right. I, I, I think we're done here. I highly recommend this book. Oh, I do have one funny line. On page 239, when they're heading into the main battle in space, in the climactic battle, Han looks over to Chewie and goes, Chewie, wait! Any modifications in the Falcon? That's, that's classic Star Wars because the, the Falcon's tied together with bubble gum and spit and duct tape. 
<laughs> that's the Falcon. That's Star Wars. And that, again, that gets it right. And that's why it's great. So that's Truce at Baccarat. If you haven't read it or listened to it on an audio tape, I, I, I suggest you do it because we're moving forward now. And unfortunately, this is a little bittersweet for some of you because this is now impossible to get. I jumped on it when I could. The next book in the timeline, I have never read this. The Heart of the Jedi, what the, this book that came out of nowhere a few months ago. I jumped on it. I got my copy. I know a lot of people hesitated and didn't get their copy. So, you, I, I, this one, not everybody's going to be able to follow along. If you can follow along, then we're going we're gonna to go forward. So, what's today? Today is Wednesday, July 14th. All right. Let's we'll just say we're going to, so 1920. We're going to say the week of August 2nd. Monday, August, week of August 2nd. You got till then to either maybe somehow get your hands on it, take time reading it. Now, I've never read this before, so I'm going to take my time. I'm going to think about it because we're going to have themes and character interactions that I've never seen before. I've got no basis for it, so I'm going to take my time to absorb it and then make my video, and then we'll talk about it. Um, we'll see how this one goes. We'll see how it goes. Heart of the Jedi by Kenneth C. Flint. I hope you have a copy of it and or hope you can find a copy of it. Maybe somebody's put up audio at this point. I don't know. Who You could hope. Either way, I'm excited to read this. It's a book I've never read before. So this is going to be fun. All right. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative and fun. If you did, a like would be appreciated. If you're new here, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I invite you to now go through the playlist I've put, toge excuse me, I've put together of the book club we've read shadows of the shadows of the empire and now truce of bakra and we're moving on to heart of the jedi share the video around spread my gospel hit the notification button i try to do one to two videos a day comment away this video is this kind of video i'm doing right now so i'm not live streaming this stuff yet it is it's kind of built upon interaction in the comments so i encourage comments in this and uh, follow me on the Geeks and Gamers forums, the thread there. I'm going to make a mirror thread where we can talk about Truce of Bakra, not Heart of the Jedi, Truce of Bakra, and try and engage over there. <sighs> well, I hope you enjoyed this again. Thank you for watching. Take it easy. Thanks for watching, everybody. I still don't do Facebook. I still don't do Twitter. But there are ways to interact with me outside of YouTube. You can email me at therednerd at gmail.com. It's purely for this channel, so there's no chance I will miss any communication from you. You can also find me active at the Geeks and Gamers forums under the handle ROAS. And I am on Parlor now. Follow me at therednerd on Parlor. Thanks again for watching. See you next time.